Hello, my name is George, um, George Milosevic. I'm a graduate student at University of Texas at Austin, and my advisor is Philip J. Morrison. And this work has been done in collaboration with him and his former student, Manas Gulingam, who is at Harvard University right now. It's called On Cascade Reversal and Extend MHD. So uh, the audience will be briefly introduced to Extend MHD and its Hamiltonian topological properties, and then we will start talking about the uh, turbulence flux transfer rates and uh, direction of cascades in 3D and uh, 2D turbulence. Uh, so recently, attention uh, has been focused towards the uh, turbulence at small scales, at least in the context of uh, astrophysical uh, turbulence uh, with the examples of Earth's magnetosphere and the solar wind. Uh, we are investigating the um, helicity cascades, um, and it's known, and MHD has been known for a very long time, that there is an inverse cascade of magnetic helicity, which is often linked uh, uh, with the dynamo mechanism. Uh, but the question that we are asking are what are the effects of the electron inertia that is oftentimes that's ignored when you do MHD and for this we are using the model called extend MHD which is formally a single fluid model but it's endowed with two fluid effects and uh, these are whole effect and the electron inertia that I just mentioned. We're going to work in authentic units normalized to a typical length scale so everything will be dimensionless and the important parameters are the uh, skin depth that you can see here so there's an ion electron skin depth uh, that are proportional to the corresponding masses. So if you ignore electron mass, you're ignoring the uh, electron skin depth. And this is the uh, sort of um, Newton's law for the bulk velocity. And if you ignore the DE, oops. Yeah, so if you ignore the uh, DE, um, then you basically recover the regular MHD. Uh, notice the star here is defined over here. It also depends on the DE, and of course you need Faraday's law. And again, so if you ignore the DE and DI terms, you're recovering regular MHD, but this system fully describes uh, um, two fluid plasma. And the various models, the various extent MHD approximations you get from here have been shown to be Hamiltonian by Abdelhamid, uh, Kawazura, and Yoshida, and this was later confirmed by us. So. Um, the reason people care about Hamiltonian methods is because um, they allow you to show that if you have a reduced model uh, in the non-dissipative limit, uh, it will conserve energy. And there are some models in the literature that do not. Um, and uh, what you work with is a Poisson bracket that gives you time evolution of uh, general functionals. Uh, this is the Poisson bracket. It depends on uh, variable of psi that uh, for extended MHD will consist of the density velocity and the B star. The star is defined in the previous slide. Um, and this is the Hamiltonian for extended MHD, which consists of the kinetic part and the uh, magnetic part and the thermal uh, part. The nice thing is that uh, this uh, Poisson bracket allows you to find the Casimir invariants, which are basically like functionals that commute with any other functional. So if you commute it with Hamiltonian, that's the time derivative of that um, Casimir that basically tells you the time derivative will be zero, therefore it's integral of motion. So this is a way to find integrals of motion. There are some other uh, perks of Hamiltonian methods that I'm not going to go into. And the Casimir invariants for extend MHD turn out to be these, which look very similar to the A dot B in MHD, uh, but they're more general because this is the definition of B plus minus, uh, which has a B star here and the vorticity. And A is basically an uncurl of B. Uh, and the kappa that you see here, there are two solutions of this quadratic equation. Um, so another property that uh, the two general two-fluid uh, model has is uh, the lead dragging of the two um, generalized magnetic fields. Um, and but basically, lead dragging is more for math people, for physics people. It's known as flux freezing, um, and I'm sure people are familiar with this. Uh, people in MHD are familiar with this. Um, so I'm going to skip. Oh, yeah, and by the way, if you're interested in topological properties of extend MHD, this is uh, our paper uh, on this topic. Okay, so now we are in position to start e exploring turbulence. We're considering the homogeneous and compressible extend MHD turbulence, and uh, people in turbulence are familiar, well, uh, are familiar with the direct uh, cascade where you have a driving range and a dissipative range. And the same flux, uh, there, there's an assumption that the same flux of energy or helicity flows through each wave number. Uh, this principle was uh, incorporated in 
this other paper that was done by my uh, collaborator um, on this work so where they found the Kolmogorov spectra for extended MHD. Um, now, the first step that we're doing, the first question that we're asking, we want to find the um, dissipation rates of uh, the helicities. And uh, um, we're basically following in the steps that were outlined by Benerji and Galtier, uh, who did this calculation for whole MHD, but we're doing the same calculation for uh, extended MHD. And uh, uh, you work with uh, uh, two-point correlation functions, uh, where x prime is basically evaluated at the display is displaced by an r from the x, and uh, the brackets denote the uh, ensemble average. And upon applying the these uh, lead dragging equations, you can easily show that this is the uh, so this is the um, evolution equation. So in a stationary regime, this should be zero, and therefore uh, the helicity flux transfer rate should equal the damping, the phenomenological damping term that we add, uh, where delta here stands for the increment and f, f prime is basically f evaluated at x prime. Um, so it's important to point out that while this expression looks uh, very similar to the one obtained by Banerjee and Galtier, it has more physics in it, it has the electron inertia that wasn't present before. And of course, in the whole image D limit, when you set DE equal to zero, you, you, you recover their results. Um, so what, what is different? Well, in whole image D, the Casimir invariants are these. So these are the helicities, the A dot B and this one. And in extended image D, it's more complicated. So this one looks uh, essentially, it's essentially the same as the MHD magnetic helicity. And this is some sort of combination of cross helicity and magnetic helicity. Here, everything is combined in extended MHD. And uh, these authors that I mentioned previously, they ar argue that in whole MHD, um, if you just look at this expression, they, they are assuming that you will get an inverse cascade um, because in MHD you have an inverse cascade of magnetic helicity. Um, while uh, this one they're arguing will have both the, both the inverse cascade if magnetic energy dominates and the uh, direct cascade of kinetic energy dominates, um, but then we are led to a question, what happens if we work with this more general model, which seems to have um, magnetic and um, kinetic contributions that are more symmetric. So uh, what are the effects of the electron inertia and how is, because if you look at this expression, it's more symmetric, so you, wouldn't ex you would expect both cascades. And so how is the direct cascade of magnetic helicity lost um, when you go to whole MHD or NMHD? Um, Okay, and so for this, we um, decided to um, basically calculate the absolute equilibrium states uh, that would predict the direction of the cascades. Uh, this method has been used uh, earlier, so basically you can find this in this uh, turbulence textbook on MHD. Uh, <coughs> basically what you do is you, uh, you find the equilibrium state and uh, that's given by this Gibbs distribution and uh, then you argue that uh, these various spectral quantities would like to uh, relax into that state. However, we're not letting them relax. We're constantly pumping the energy, okay? Um, so this is a partition function uh, and uh, Langlange mu multipliers and the integrals of motion, which are basically energy and uh, the helicities, okay? And this approach has been um, successfully invoked in hydrodynamics and MHD by Kreiknan and Frisch. So, um, yeah, that's the reason we're using it. Okay. So, the thing is that we wish to compare our results to those in the literature. Uh, this, this particular one was done in MHD. And the problem is that the generalized helicities that I mentioned earlier, they kind of both become magnetic helicity when you ignore the, yeah, it was on the previous slides, but uh, they, they're very symmetric and they both become magnetic helicity if you ignore the uh, electron skin depth and the ion skin depth. So what I did is I combined, I found a linear combination that's more suitable for my purposes because this one, uh, if you ignore the electron skin depth and the, uh, then, then this becomes A dot B and this term disappears. And if you ignore the ion uh, skin depth, then this term disappears and you get V dot B. So this one becomes like cross helicity and this one becomes magnetic helicity. Um, so it's more consistent with the MHD. So um, in uh, whole MHD, uh, so yeah, the first thing that we do is we calculate the absolute equilibrium states for whole image D um, because um, the expressions that you get in general are very uh, complicated. Um, 
So these um, equilibrium states are found, uh, by the way, in the Fourier space. So you have to plug this in and uh, then find the expression. This is the spectral quantity that corresponds to the magnetic helicity. And we're, it's important to point out that we're interested in um, how much of it we have per uh, wave number magnitude. So you have to multiply by this 4 pi k square in 3D. Um, and you get some complicated expression. Um, and then we do some analytical uh, queries that I'm not going to go into. Um, but um, eventually, um, we analytically show that these are really representative plots for the spectral quantities of interest. So this is the energy, cross helicity, and magnetic helicity. Uh, and uh, the idea is if a spectral quantity is peaked at high k, it means that it would like to flow, uh, it would like to have a direct cascade, whereas if it's peaked at the low k, it would like to have an inverse cascade. Remember that low k corresponds to uh, large scales and the high k corresponds to the um, small scales. So this is uh, basically consistent with MHD uh, and uh, this result has been obtained earlier actually by some Servidio and some other authors. Uh, so this is basically known and consistent with numerical simulations. Uh, what is less known is uh, the inertial MHD limit. So inertial MHD is a model that uh, lacks the whole drift. However, is it, it does have the electron inertia. Um, so uh, basically you drop the DI and it simplifies your uh, calculations considerably. Um, and in addition, we have to assume something else to get a nice result. And we're assuming that we are in a very short scales, so much smaller than the electron skin depth. And in this case, this kind of expression is obtained from magnetic helicity and the corresponding expressions for the in energy and cross helicity. And the plots are here. So this is energy, cross helicity, magnetic helicity. Uh, so the colors, by the way, correspond to different values of total cross helicity over the uh, energy. Um, and what you see is that there is a marked difference in how magnetic helicity behaves. So this is a direct cascade, again, because it's peaked at the high k, so it would like to flow into the uh, smaller scales. Uh, and uh, this is the main result of our paper in New Journal of Physics, where we're claiming that uh, we're predicting that there should be a cascade reversal um, when you cross this DE scale. Of course, it hasn't been confirmed yet numerically, which we would like to do very much um, as soon as possible. Um, okay, so now before I go into the, yeah, let me go into the uh, 2D results that we got. So these are not published yet. Um, the thing about 2D, First of all, the numerical simulations here would be much easier. Also, that in 2D, inertial MHD is more justified because um, basically, if it's a pure 2D though, you can essentially drop the ion skin depth. It doesn't really, uh, um, it doesn't, the equations of motion don't depend on it. Um, and uh, uh, what, you you, what you do is you represent the fields in this clash like form. So this is like a reduced MHD, except this is reduced extend MHD. Uh, you have like flux functions and string functions. And for simplicity, I'm assuming that z direction is completely absent. Uh, so b and nu are zero, so that we are in pure 2D. And recently, there was a paper that uh, also inspired me to do this 2D extend MHD turbulence. Um, there was a paper by Grasso who uh, obtained um, um, a Hamiltonian formalism for reduced uh, uh, extend MHD. And so the Casimir invariants were available to us. And, uh, uh, so we have two continuous sets of Casimir invariants. In fact, uh, they're a little bit more general, but we are using quadratic ones because uh, quadratic invariants will um, survive under truncation. And we do, tr we do truncate our continuous K space, um, right? So that's why we, we would like to have quadratic invariants. And I need to define certain quantities here. So the Psi, the Psi is a flux function. And the Psi star is like the B star of extended image D. Uh, in fact, it very closely corresponds to it. Uh, omega is the Laplacian of phi, so if phi is a stream function. Uh, so this is like magnetic helicity in some sense, and this is like a cross helicity because it's like a little bit like V dot V in this, um, yeah, this it corresponds to it in some sense. Um, and uh, yeah, so uh, next we do again the standard uh, Fourier expansion, and these are the spectral quantities for F and for the Hamiltonian, and I'm, again, I'm not listing every, I'm not listing cross-helicity because it would take too much space. 
Um, and we seek the equilibrium states that are given by this uh, Gibbs distribution. And this is the equilibrium for F. Uh, it's a more simple expression than the one that you had in 3D case. So now you can consider, to understand how it behaves when you uh, um, change the K, um, it's, uh, it's convenient to, again, make some assumptions. First of them is pretty common in this kind of business, is to assume that cross helicity is zero. Uh, that leads to gamma equals zero, so this parameter is zero. Um, and um, then this, this part just disappears. And uh, consider the MHD limit. So the MHD limit has been handled by Pfeiff and other authors a uh, long time ago, um, and then confirmed in numerical simulations. So basically that's if KD is much less than one, uh, then this quantity, okay, so you can actually do this in your head. If KD is much less than one, then you can drop this term. So this uh, denominator scales as one, and numerator goes as K squared. Uh, this is zero, beta you can kind of uh, ignore under, uh, you also have to analyze, there are some normalizability conditions that restrain where these quantities can be. So uh, roughly speaking, this term scales as K squared. Um, and uh, this is inverse. Right, so it's one over k squared, but remember you have to multiply by the uh, volume of your uh, space, which is two pi k uh, in 2D, and so this term scales as one over k, and that's the uh, typical sort of inverse relationship that suggests an inverse cascade um, for this quantity. And for the energy, you have a, a linear relationship, so I'm not listing this expression, but uh, it's a similar sort of estimation. Uh, and this, is, this has been known, so we are basically recovering their expression. Um, however, this is a sort of more new result where we're looking at the small scale, so this is extend MHD limit, scale smaller than the uh, electron skin depth. And in this case, again, you can do it in your head, so KD is very large, so one can be ignored, so K cancels out, so this is constant, this, remember, is zero because we're considering that the states are not, you know, like V is not parallel to B, basically. Uh, so there's no cross helicity, so this term is also not there, and this is constant, and uh, then you have to multiply the constant by k, which uh, means it goes linearly with k, um, so there's a different behavior here. Uh, the energy, though, behaves the same way, so it's a direct cascade, it's a direct cascade, this is an inverse cascade, and this is a direct cascade, so there's a cascade reversal into d as well. Okay, so I think I'm doing well on time, no? <laughs> Um, okay, so to sum up, we have addressed recent interest in short-scale um, astrophysical turbulence, um, and um, mostly theoretically, we haven't really applied it anywhere. We're hoping the people will apply it somewhere. And this is a little table that kind of um, um, tells you how the different uh, invariants behave as you go through the scale. So MHD governs the large scales, so MHD smaller, and inertial MHD even smaller scales. And then there are new 2D results that um, also kind of behave in a similar fashion. So the energy is always a direct cascade, the cross list is direct cascade, and in the inverse cascade becomes a direct cascade uh, for the magnetic helicity. Okay, um, and so, yeah. Uh, so the also the dissipation rates were computed, but they basically motivated us to look for the uh, cascade reversal. Uh, and uh, the lack of uh, the inverse cascade at small scales may have impact in um, dynamo theory. Um, we plan to test the direction of cascades in 2D numerically and maybe in 3D. There are some new results by Servideo in 3D that I haven't really had time to look at. Um, and uh, yeah, so recently we have uh, found a Hamiltonian description for relativistic extent MHD that uh, hopefully will allow us to find the corresponding Casimirs so that we can do the same spill for relativistic case. And uh, yeah, so that we can calculate the turbulent relativistic cascades. So thank you for your attention. I'm done. Which one? Like this one is fine, or the 3D one? Uh, the, right before. Uh, the one before. Well, there is one here, but uh, it's it's uh, essentially all the same for the 3D, and this is a Gibbs distribution also.
Mm, yes. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I suppose you're referring to your paper in 2002 with Mahajan? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so I haven't really, mm, I, I know about this uh, objection, but uh, I, I haven't really found a solution to this. So really numerical simulations I think will show whether uh, this will be equilibrium or not. Oh, okay, so you can determine, I mean, there's a sort of formal way of determining them by taking integrals of uh, these expressions, integrating them, and then finding the total uh, F and total G and total H, and then you have to invert, and after you invert, you'll find the, uh, um, but the problem is that the expressions are often trans, in fact, for this case will be transcendental, and especially for the 3D case. Uh, so what I do instead is, um, uh, I can find them numerically, so I cannot do this analytically. And also, in addition to these, um, you can use uh, sort of um, normalizability conditions. So uh, you have to make sure that this probability distribution function is, uh, so maybe that answers your question, I'm not sure. Uh, it needs to be um, uh, positive definite. Uh, I mean, like the, this uh, quadratic form needs to be positive definite. Um, and uh, that puts constraints on alpha, beta, and gamma. Uh, if it's not positive definite, then you know you won't like it won't be the probability distribution won't be integrable and uh, square integrable. So, uh, so we find those constraints, and that re reduces the possible. Otherwise, if you look at uh, previous equations, I hope I'm not taking too much time. Uh, yeah, so this this is pretty horrible. However, it behaves mostly like this. Um, and the way we saw this is we basically constrained the possible values of alpha, beta, and gamma by the normalizability conditions. I mean, it's, uh, it may be sensitive, but this typical behavior will not change. So it's, it's going to be an uh, inverse relationship here, and it's going to be direct rela relationship here. Um, at least I haven't seen it change, and according to, so we analytically we considered uh, sort of more two cases, um, if I'm being more precise, two uh, extreme cases, and the plots basically match them. So I, I'm kind of confident that that's how things will go. Thank yeah, you. all right.